All right, so let's see how B cell activation occurs. So the first step in B cell activation is uh, that B cells in the lymph tissue uh, check to see if their um, antigen binding sites bind the pathogen, and if they don't, then they'll just go away. So all B cells that are flowing through a lymph node will check to see if their antigen binding sites bind. And we said that the first two don't, their antigen binding sites don't have any affinity for any molecules on the surface of the pathogen. But this B cell number three there, its antigen binding site has uh, a three-dimensional shape that just so happens to bind molecules on the surface of this pathogen. So let's see how this is going to trigger B cell activation. So here's our B cell. Um, and here's our pathogen shown in red. Now, you'll notice when I draw a B cell that's not activated, that I spread out the B cell receptors. And you should remember what a B cell receptor is. It's the Ig, which I'm drawing as these Y's molecules. So there's IgM and IgD. And there's two little um, yellow proteins, that's Ig alpha and Ig beta. These make up the B cell receptor. And we're actually going to see the function of Ig alpha and Ig beta right now. So, uh, if this B cell approaches this pathogen, and this B cell just so happens, by random chance, its VDJs and its junctional diversities and its variable uh, light and heavy chain just so happens to have a 3D structure that binds something on the surface of the pathogen, when this B cell approaches the pathogen, all the IGs in the uh, B cell receptors will swing to one side of the B cell and cluster together so that they are all brought in close proximity with one another. And this is called uh, B-cell receptor cross-linking. So as I said before, when I draw a naive B-cell, I usually spread out the B-cell receptors. And that's true in a B-cell, you've got the, uh, in, or in any cell, you've got the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. Proteins are just sort of move, floating around the plasma membrane, all around the circumference of the cell. So um, if the B-cell receptors run into each other, they just don't really hang out with each other if they're in the, in the absence of antigen. But in the presence of antigen, you can see all the B-cell receptors cluster together. We call that B-cell receptor cross-linking. This is the first step that is required for B-cell activation. So how does bringing them all in close proximity help uh, B-cells activate? So we've got to zoom in to the... Uh, B cell receptors in the intra um, in the uh, cytoplasmic portion or the intracellular portion, there are proteins that are associated with the B cell receptors inside uh, in the cytoplasm, and these are tyrosine kinases. So hopefully you recall from biochemistry, a kinase is an enzyme that transfers uh, transfers a phosphate to a hydroxyl group. A tyrosine kinase uh, transfers a phosphate to a tyrosine. Uh, um, hydroxyl, if you recall the amino acid tyrosine. So there are tyrosine kinases with names like BLK, FYN, LYN, that are associated with the B cell receptor. They're binding there. They were there before. I never showed them to you, but I'm showing them to you now, those little brown proteins. If we look at the uh, zoom in at uh, one B cell receptor, you can see there's a tyrosine kinase. It's just sort of hanging out with the um, Ig chains, Ig alpha, the Ig beta. So when, um, oh, there's some other part I really need to tell you, and involves Ig alpha and Ig beta, right? So these are proteins, and part of their amino acid sequence are these very conserved tyrosine residues. So if you recall, Y is the amino acid abbreviation for tyrosine. So I've drawn some Ys, some tyrosines, in the intracellular or cytoplasmic tail of the Ig alpha and beta proteins. These are very special tyrosines. They are part of the intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. We call them ITAMs, intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. Now, here I'm just showing you one B cell receptor. It's not near any other B cell receptor. And the tyrosine kinase, it is not active. It's not phosphorylating anything. And these Ys, these tyrosines, they are not phosphorylated. This is what it looks like when a B cell is not active. Now let's say the B cell has encountered a pathogen and all of its B cell receptors cluster together and they're using their antigen binding sites to bind some protein, for example, that's on the surface of this pathogen. So the protein is covering the pathogen and these B cell receptors all cluster together. That's B cell receptor cross-linking. So 
All of these B-cell receptors have tyrosine kinases associated with them. They all have IG-alpha and beta proteins that have these ITAMs, these special tyrosines in these region um, called intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. And now when you bring all these B-cell receptors together, you cross-link them, what happens are these tyrosine kinases become activated and they transfer phosphates to the tyrosines of nearby B-cell receptors. So there's a, t there's a tyrosine kinase putting phosphate groups on those ITAMs. And the, this other B cell receptor, it's going to take its tyrosine kinase and it's going to transfer phosphates to the other ITAMs. So now I'm drawing little phosphate groups uh, connected to these ty uh, tyrosines. So these are, this is phosphorylation. So when B cell receptors cross-link, it results in phosphorylation of ITAMs. If ITAMs become phosphorylated, that triggers signal transduction through the cytoplasm into the nucleus, which will tell the cell, hey, we've been activated, we've been called to duty, um, let's activate, let's undergo mitosis and form an army of clones. So I'm not going to cover signal transduction uh, in this video or in this class, but there are proteins that will send the signal from the plasma membrane all the way into the nucleus. And that's the first signal that is required for B cell activation. So it involves B cell receptor cross-linking, activation of tyrosine kinases, phosphorylation of ITAMs.